Hello and welcome to my senior project presentation. My name is Isaac Johnson, and I studied the solar system, specifically a computational model of it. So the, the desire to know the motion of the heavenly bodies has driven mathematics for centuries. It's really been at the forefront of discoveries in many of the branches of mathematics. And our project was to create a numerical simulation of the outer solar system using MATLAB. And we thought it would be an interesting challenge to attempt to recreate the data that led to the discovery of Neptune. So for the format of this talk, there's gonna be four parts. Firstly, I'm gonna talk about the problem. Then I'll talk about the method, then some general orbital results. And finally, we'll talk about the outer solar system and the discovery of Neptune. So in mathematics systems, much like in games, uh, you could think of them as having rule books. And so the rule book we're going to use is given by Newton's universal law of gravitation. Now, there's other rule books you could pick from. You could pick from um, Einstein's general relativity. Uh, you're going to have a lot harder time with the project. So Newton's laws do pretty good for uh, our intents. And so what the universal gravitation law does is it relates the force on one body by another body, um, and it bases it on the masses of each body and the distance between the two bodies. And we're gonna go ahead and start with the case of a one sun, one planet system, and then build up from that, since that's really the simplest unique interaction. So for that case, we're going to put the sun at the center of the coordinate system, since Usually stars are much more massive than the planets that orbit them. So they're really not going to move all that much. So we're gonna assume they don't move. All right. So once again, the star is much more massive than the planet. So we fix the star at the origin. This is an approximation, keep that in mind. So actually the sun would be orbiting the, the center of mass of the solar system, but it's it's, so much of the mass of the solar system is the star that it, we're just gonna pretend it doesn't move for ease of calculation. So firstly, Newton's second law is used to find the acceleration on the planet, right? Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. Then for the force term, we can plug in universal gravitation law and that yields us the second line of math. Then notice that we can divide both sides by mass one and the mass is canceled. So the acceleration on the planet actually doesn't depend on the mass of the planet, which is really quite interesting. This is actually similar to the reasons why um, heavy things fall at the same rate as light things on Earth, um, neglecting air resistance. So the one star, one planet system, um, it, its rules manifest as an ordinary differential equation because acceleration is the second time derivative of position. So that's this blue equation down here. Okay, so we know the rules. Now what? Turns out uh, knowing the rules is the easy part. As an analogy, um, knowing the rules of chess does not make me a grandmaster, right? Um, it's probably the easiest part of the game. So um, from then, using the rules, um, this differential equation we found to find unique predictions of solar system orbits, requires knowledge of the initial conditions, that'd be initial position and velocity of the planet, and clever techniques. It turns out that general solutions exist for the one star, one planet system, and were first explained by Kepler's three laws, but later confirmed with Newton's newly found calculus. And so notice over here that what Newton found and Kepler before him found was that bound orbits for the one star, one planet system are ellipses, elliptical orbits, like in the blue orbit here, and unbound orbits are hyperbola, seen in red. So unbound means that the red the red object isn't coming back. Um, it's, it's going to continue on and never return to this particular star's system. So solutions do exist for the one planet, one sun system. However, general solutions do not exist for two or more planets. And so for that reason, we're going to need to um, approximate more complex solutions. So we should probably talk about approximating solutions. 
So a first order differential equation tells us what the slope is of the true solution at any point in time or in space for other equations. So the initial conditions and the slope information can be used to take an approximate step forward in time. So the way I like to describe this is if you were walking down a path blindfolded, but you had a friend that wasn't blindfolded who could tell you which way to turn. But of course your friend can't feed you continuous information. So you have to like take a step and then ask which way to turn and then take a step and ask which way to turn. And you kind of end up with this, you know, it's not a smooth curve, but it's an approximate shape of the path that you're attempting to walk on. So the initial condition for this true solution here is uh, at zero time, the position is minus one. We know the differential equation for the system, so we can know the slope at that point in time. It looks like zero slope for that point in time. So we extend a linear approximation with that slope through some fixed time interval. In this case, it was a time step of one. Then we figure out what the slope is at that point in time using the differential equation. And we draw a line parallel to that tangent slope uh, through once again, a time step of one. This process is iterated as many times as you like until you get an approximate solution. And this approximate solution doesn't look great, but we only took five time steps. So if we took 10, looks a little bit better. 20 steps, now it's visually pleasing. The, the approximate solution looks pretty smooth. And with 50 steps, visually there's they're very close now. So um, more steps increases the accuracy of your approximate solution. However, it costs more computational, um, uh, it has a higher computational cost. Whether that means you have to leave your computer running for longer or you have to get a faster computer. So the specific algorithm that we just discussed was called Euler's method. It's the simplest way to approximate a uh, differential equation solution. But the method we're gonna use for this project is called the velocity relay algorithm. And it's a time stepping method. And so you see there's these four equations that will update three quantities. For each time step, they update the position, the acceleration on the body, and the velocity that the body has at that time step. This method only works if a function of the acceleration for a body is known. And luckily for this problem, we actually have exactly such an equation. It's Newton's universal law of gravitation. And we already derived that, that acceleration function earlier. It only depends on where the planet is with respect to the sun. So um, here's kind of an animation of what's going on. So at some point in time, I'm calling it the ith time step. We know the acceleration, the velocity, and the radius uh, vector or the position vector of the planet. Then we can use that information to take a linear step forward. So that's a linear approximation and update all the quantities, updated velocity, updated acceleration, updated position. And this process can be iterated continually until you have some approximate orbit. However, each spatial dimension requires another evaluation of these four equations. So for each planet that you are approximating the solution of, um, it essentially takes four equations, three dimensions. It takes 12 equation evaluations per time step. So using the velocity relay method, for the star planet system yielded this result to the right. This was with only 20 steps, which is not nearly enough as we can tell. Um, the blue orbit is Kepler's orbit, which is the true orbit that we should be seeing. So maybe we'll pump it up to 40 steps. It's getting a little better. 80 steps, a little better. We still, the start and finish point aren't overlapping yet. Gets closer with 160 steps. 320, we're almost there. Um, 30,000 steps looks pretty good. So you can always take more steps to increase accuracy. And this led us to a nearly elliptical orbit. And this is a good indication 
but the method we're using is producing well-known, reasonable results. All right, now we're gonna talk about what if there's more than one planet in the system? So the general in-body problem refers to a gravitational problem with an arbitrary number of masses. So if you had three masses, it would be the three body problem. So N would be three. This problem becomes vastly complex. Um, if N is greater than two, no useful general analytic solutions exist. There's nothing you can do with just pen and paper to give you a true solution. And um, as you can see up here, I have the two body system. I've got a force diagram of, or I guess it's the th a three body system, but it's restricted because the sun isn't allowed to move. So this is a one star, two planet system. There's the force diagram. And up here is the two differential equations that govern the motion of these bodies. You could think of these two equations as the rules of the game where there's one star and two planets. And so really the end body problem is a perfect subject for numerical methods like the velocity relay method or others because there is no general analytic solution. So we ran a simulation with the velocity relay of two planets and a star. For the first video, the mass of the sun is 12 arbitrary units and each planet has a mass of 0.2. All right, so now the planets are actually interacting with each other. And so it looks like we're not gonna get nice elliptical orbits anymore. And because the elliptical orbits were a result of the one planet, one star system. And now we've got planets that are interacting with each other and it's throwing that off. So for the second video though, I set each, each planet's mass to zero. And this was to test the code, make sure it's, it's giving out reasonable results. Of course, if the planets have no gravitational effect on each other, then we would expect them to go back to elliptical orbits, closed elliptical orbits. And we see that as the case. And of course, the elliptical orbits are in a different plane. The elliptical orbit of the blue planet is in the plane defined by the blue planet and the, and the star. Um, all right, so seemingly reasonable results. Now we have to jump up to a star and four planets because one of the goals of this project ended up being to model the outer solar system. So we needed four planets and a star. For the first simulation, all the planets have zero mass. Uh, this is a, a test to make sure we're getting those reasonable elliptical orbits. Now it looks like the blue orbit's nice and closed and elliptical, so is the green, so is the magenta, and so is the red. So this is a reasonable result. For the second simulation, we pumped up the masses of the planets to 0.2 star having a mass of 12. So now the planets are interacting with each other gravitationally and we're no longer seeing nice periodic behavior or nice elliptical orbits. For the third simulation, I pump the planets masses all up to one just for fun. Things get pretty crazy here. I mean, these orbits don't even closely resemble ellipses at all. So this is something to be grateful for. If we lived in a solar system where the planet's masses were a reasonable fraction of the sun's mass, we would have complete chaos. There would be no such thing as a year. Uh, there would be no consistency. However, in our solar system, luckily 99.87% of the mass is the sun, right? Uh, whereas the other 0.13% the other, uh, of the mass is the planet's. So now that we have this four planet, one star system, to move forward, we need accurate initial positions of the bodies we're interested in approximating the uh, orbits of. Now NASA is the foremost in this field with their horizon system. It's open to the public to use, but the methods are proprietary. Uh, however, I know that they use a combination of observational and numerical methods to better model our solar system. So you can see over here, you can pick your target body. I picked Neptune. 
coordinate center, center of the solar system's mass. Pick a time. Here I've got October 13th, 1750 pick. And then it spits out the Cartesian position vector and the Cartesian velocity vector. I can plug those into my program and let the velocity relay algorithm uh, work its course. So now we're on to the story of the discovery of Neptune. Uh, Uranus was discovered in 1781 by Carolyn and William Herschel and observations were noted for the next 60 years. Now, there were two mathematicians in particular, um, John Koch Adams and Urbain Le Verrier, and both of them were like really good at this, this new perturbation theory uh, where they could kind of calculate where Uranus should be based on the planetary effects from Saturn and Jupiter. And their calculations didn't match the astronomer's actual observational data. There is a discrepancy in Uranus's heliocentric longitude angle. And we'll discuss what that is in the next slide. But for now, what's important is that there was a discrepancy between the calculated and the observed. It turns out these discrepancies were due to the ignorance of Neptune's gravitational effect on Uranus. So for us to recreate the discrepancy, we ran two simulations of the outer solar system. The first one I'm about to run um, is without Neptune. So you've got Jupiter in blue, Saturn in red, and uh, Uranus is in light green. Nice, orderly, um, beautiful periodic orbits, thanks to the sun for being so massive. Then we ran simulation of our solar system, outer solar system with Neptune involved and magenta. So you can see right now, Neptune's kind of pulling Uranus to go faster in its orbit, but now Uranus is getting pulled backwards by Neptune. So the orbit would be slowing down. So this is what caused the discrepancy in the data. So this discrepancy, like I said, was the difference between the heliocentric longitude of Uranus observations versus calculations without the knowledge of Neptune. So picture each planet having a line drawn to it from the sun. The angle between these lines for two planets is what we would call the difference in their heliocentric longitude angles. So if you look over here, this video I'm about to show you, there are two planets, both of the same mass and same initial position and velocity. And one of them has an unknown gravitational effect on it. So I go ahead and hit play. And for the first little bit, they look to be doing very similar things, but then that unknown gravitational effect takes hold. And we start seeing that, you see that light blue line and the, and the light red line? The angle that subtends that is the difference in the heliocentric longitude. So the analogy here is think about the blue planet as Uranus with Neptune's effects and the red planet as Uranus without Neptune's effects. And this angle between the light blue and red lines is that discrepancy that we're talking about. Now, the example video is exaggerated for ease of visualization. The red and blue dots, uh, once again, are analogous to Uranus with and without Neptune's effects. All right, let's go to the data. So the plot to the right shows the historical discrepancy versus our simulated one. So notice that the y-axis is in arc seconds. That's the heliocentric longitude discrepancy. An arc second is very small. It's a measure of angle, and it's equivalent to 1 hundredth of a degree. Definitely not something that you could find on a protractor. And um, the orange data here, that is John Koch Adams' uh, discrepancy by taking observed data for the angle and subtracting his calculated data for the angle. And then the blue line is, is our discrepancy from our simulated outer solar system. Remember, we ran with Neptune's effects and without. We took the difference, the angle between the two of, of Uranus. So, the differences between our results and John Koch Adams are actually quite large. This is probably due to error in our model and his model. 
but keep in mind that Leverrier and Adams worked their calculation predictions by hand. And not only did they work them by hand, beyond calculating the discrepancy, they also played guess and check for where to place this new planet so that they would best fit the discrepancy curve with their calculations. Very amazing. Um, now they did use something called Bode's Law, which says that each planet is roughly twice as far from the sun as the last planet. So that kind of helped them narrow down one of the parameters. Um, but it's still a lot of hand calculation, very incredible. And both of them predicted where astronomers should look to see Neptune. And uh, after that prediction, Leverrier sent his, his predictions to a French astronomer, um, Johann Gale. And Gale looked in the sky where Leverrier told him to. And he found a new planet, uh, Neptune, within one degree of Leverrier's prediction. It's a very incredible story and a testament to the power of, of mathematics. All right, so that was my project. Here are my references. And I appreciate you participating in my project. Thank you.